on to the next topic on uh, myopathies, uh, the entity of acquired myopathies. Uh, before moving into the uh, topic proper, um, I would like to, um, uh, the, the, mus the term muscle has uh, derived from the Latin term of uh, musculus, uh, which is, um, uh, which uh, means a little mouse, maybe because the contracting muscle takes the shape of a little mouse. So uh, when looking at the structure of the muscles, you know, there are three types of muscles in human body. And when we are talking about the myopathies, we are mainly concerned about the skeletal muscles. So skeletal muscles are made up of uh, the muscle fiber, which is uh, composed of uh, several muscle fibrils uh, connected together. And then the muscle fibers are composed of these uh, muscle fibrils and um, the muscle fiber bundles uh, uh, forming fascicles are bound together by the perimysium and the epimysium to form a muscle. And uh, there are mainly two types of muscle fibers um, which we are concerned in doing uh, muscle biopsies and uh, disease entities uh, depending on their availability of the blood supply, the number of mitochondria, the, how they get their uh, energy from and how fast they act and how long they last for, the, the action lasts for. The, uh, depending on these categories, the muscle fibers are divided mainly into two types, type 1 and type 2. And type 1 are the slow twitch fibers uh, seen in long distance runners mainly and uh, the type 2 fibers are slow twitch but they fatigue easily and there are three types of type 2 fibers 2a, 2b and 2x. Uh, the, the, what is a myopathy? It's a clinical disorder of skeletal muscles that results in either loss of muscle strength or dysfunction due to the, the uh, disease of the structure, channels or metabolism of the skeletal muscle. Uh, usually in uh, acquired forms, it's the structure uh, and the metabolism of the muscles that we are mostly uh, concerned of rather than the channel of uh, Usually the patients present with the proximal muscle weakness, but uh, there are varieties of um, other patterns of weakness and dysfunction seen uh, in uh, various categories of disease entities. Um, so my first pearl is when to suspect a myopathy when you encounter a patient. Usually the patients will present with muscle weakness, usually it's a proximal muscle weakness starting from the pelvic girdle and then when the disease is progressing they, that would uh, uh, progress to involve the, the shoulder girdles as well but there are entities with distal muscle involvement uh, without any sensory sign and normal reflexes. The reflexes would be diminished when the muscles get atrophied a lot. So myopathies are inherited or acquired. Inherited variety is dealt by Dr. Saraji already. And acquired myopathies can be categorized into inflammatory forms and the non-inflammatory forms. So when to suspect an acquired myopathy is when a patient presents to you is fairly in an older age and when the patient present with all either acute or subacute presentation, when the patient has muscle tenderness, or when the patient comes with uh, lots of constitutional symptoms like fever, loss of appetite, uh, fatigue, and ill health, and when there's uh, no family history, and when the patient comes with a precipitant of uh, the precipitant, uh, identifiable precipitant, you should look always for a acquired myopathy. So the causes of acquired myopathies are either inflammatory or non-inflammatory. The inflammatory myopathies are always dealt with carefully because they are always treatable. And um, once you recognize the entity, there are a lot of associations that we need to look for in these patients. And the acquired non-inflammatory myopathies are again, most of them are treatable and reversible. Uh, they are the infectious, endocrine, secondary metabolic myopathies, not like the genetic metabolic myopathies. There are secondary metabolic myopathies as well. And myopathies associated with systemic illnesses and drug and toxin-induced myopathies. Uh, 
So uh, I'll be dealing a little detail um, in uh, on inflammatory myopathies because, as I told you, they are treatable and we need to look for several other conditions once we diagnose inflammatory myopathies. The spectrum has um, three major categories, uh, the polymyositis, dermatomyositis spectrum, inclusion body myositis, and the necrotizing autoimmune myositis. The whole mark is inflammation with systemic involvement here. So they are uh, rare entities actually. The prevalence is 14 per uh, 100,000 population. The peak age range at onset is in 50s and usually in children it occurs at 5 to 15 years of age. Apart from the inclusion body myositis which is more common in males, all the other myositis are uh, twice common in females. Uh, the, there are non-specific clinical features like the, the constitutional symptoms. Most of these patients present initially with unspecific, the fever, fatigue, myalgia, and arthralgia. So the dermatomyositis, polymyositis, uh, though it was considered earlier as two different uh, clinical entities, now they recognize these entities as a spectrum. And uh, it was described first in 1975. And uh, the hallmark is myositis or inflammation of the muscle with systemic involvement. The systemic involvement can give rise to dysphagia, dysphonia, the interstitial lung disease, cardiac involvement, and the cutaneous manifestations. The dermatomyositis has typical cutaneous manifestations and it has uh, increased risk of association with uh, underlying malignancies. Uh, the whole, the, the typical clinical manifestations of dermatomyositis, cutaneous manifestations are the heliotrope rash, uh, the mechanics hands over here, the Gottron's papules, the shawl sign, and in kids, what we see mostly is uh, the cutaneous um, ulceration and subcutaneous calcifications, and you will see uh, vasculopathy as well in the pediatric age group. So clinical, there are so many clinical sub, sub, subsets. The lone polymyositis is when the myositis is associated without any other systemic manifestation. And juvenile dermatomyositis uh, is a um, uh, non-entity with the patient present under the age of 18. Usually it's the age of five to 15 years. And uh, the amyopathic dermatomyositis is when you see the cutaneous manifestations of dermatomyositis, but the, the myositis uh, entity is seen only in specific imaging or only in the biopsy. The dermatomyositis sign dermatomyositis is when only the histological features of dermatomyositis is there, but the, you can't see any um, over trash or clinical manifestations. So pathological uh, hallmark is involving the cellular as well as humoral uh, immune mechanisms, giving rise to uh, muscle fiber necrosis. And all types of muscles, type one and type two fibers get involved here. And you will see a lot of inflammatory markers appearing, inflammatory cells appearing in the muscle biopsy. The polymyositis usually uh, involves the endomyceal or inside the muscles and perimyceal uh, uh, inflammation, but the dermatomyositis, you would see a lot of perivascular inflammatory cells. The, the next entity of inflammatory myopathy is, is uh, the inclusion body myositis, a quite different clinical entity and a different pathological entity from the dermatomyositis polymyositis uh, spectrum. Usually these patients are elderly, presenting uh, at the age of more than 50 years. The myopathy, the myositis is involved with a lot of degenerative changes in the muscle. And usually the weakness pattern here is uh, the combination of proximal and distal, uh, starting with the uh, finger flexor weakness and then they would develop ankle dorsiflexor weakness and the knee extensor weakness and a lot of them would present with the axial muscle involvement so they would be having head drop and camptochromia.
and dysphagia is seen in more than half of the patients and usually this clinical entity is not responsive to immune modulation therapy. Because the patients are elderly and because there are some, uh, the axial involvement, uh, patients would tend to fall a lot and there is high degree of disability in these patients with inclusion body myositis and the muscle fiber, the muscle biopsy would show muscle fiber degeneration with only a little inflammation and there would be the typical intracellular uh, rimmed vacuoles and a lot of uh, the the degenerative proteins like uh, amyloid beta and amyloid precursor proteins. So these are all degenerative changes, uh, the deposits that we see in muscle biopsy. The next entity of inflammatory myopathies is the immune mediated necrotizing myopathy. Fortunately, a rare entity, but a very severe condition associated with proximal muscle weakness. Uh, sometimes it can uh, involve the respiratory and swallowing muscles as well. The patients would present with very high CPK and patients are really ill and usually they would go into rhabdomyolysis. Most of the cases are idiopathic, but uh, there would be um, underlying malignancies and statins can cause about uh, one third of the cases and underlying connective tissue, tissue disorders and the post viral infections can give rise to uh, an Im immune mediated necrotizing myopathy. The autoantibodies um, are uh, quite commonly seen in patients with uh, autoimmune uh, necrotizing myopathy and the statin associated uh, necrotizing myopathy would uh, give rise to positive anti-HMG CoA reductase antibodies and the teeter usually correlates well with the disease uh, severity as well. And the other antibodies that we can see are anti-signal recognition particle proteins here. So when uh, how to evaluate a patient with uh, immune mediated myopathies, myositis. Uh, the inflammatory markers and the full blood count are usually uh, elevated in uh, half of the patient, more than half of the patients actually. And rheumatoid factor would be positive in half of the patients and patients would present with myoglobinuria. Uh, the muscle enzymes uh, are elevated most of the time, but in inclusion body myositis, the muscle enzymes may be, the CPK level may be normal or even low. And even in the patients with uh, inflammatory myopathies, the polymyositis, dermatomyositis usually give rise to modest uh, increase of CPK, whereas the necrotizing myopathies would give rise to very high CPK levels. And the other muscle enzymes like lactate dehydrogenase, AST and ALT, aldolase, all would be high in these patients with inflammatory myopathies. The EMG would show uh, evidence of membrane irritability and increased insertional activity. And there are um, the, the myopathic patterns as well as membrane irritability and positive sharp waves as well. Uh, the, the muscle biopsy is a pearl because selecting the muscle for the muscle biopsy is very crucial in getting the maximum data from the muscle biopsy. So when you select a muscle for the biopsy, always go for a uh, uh, moderately weak muscle. There should be at least grade 4 power. Uh, don't go a very weak muscle uh, because you might not see any changes. You might see only the atrophy of the muscles. So go for a uh, uh, muscle which, is, uh, which has a weakness at least grade 4 and uh, always tell, mark the site of the muscle that you should you are going to biopsy and always discuss with your lab that we are you are going to do a muscle biopsy and ask for the preparation there and the the standard procedure is to uh, keep the biopsy sample in a uh, moist gauze, not a soaked, uh, very, very uh, uh, soaked gauze. You should moist the gauze with a normal saline, not in formalin, and uh, close it in an airtight container and send it on ice to the 
laboratory. The, the muscle biopsy helps you to confirm the muscle inflammation and identify the type of the inflammation and uh, that would recognize the other non-inflammatory um, uh, uh, myopathic types as well. But in inflammatory myopathies, the muscle biopsy can be negative because the disease entity is has a patchy involvement of the muscles. The antibodies are the, the two types in autoimmune myopathies. Myositis specific antibodies are myositis and myositis, asso myositis associated antibodies. The myositis specific antibodies are directed towards specific proteins and they are either antisynthetase, anti-SSP or the other antibodies like anti-MI2, TIF1. So anti jo antibody is anti-TRNA synthetase antibody which is usually seen in patients with um, uh, antisynthetase syndrome. Uh, and polymyositis. And the SRP is seen in polymyositis, 4% of the patient with polymyositis, and it indicates a very severe disease. And the TIF1 gamma uh, indicates an underlying malignancy. So all these antibodies has their own specifications. And anti-HMGCR antibody is associated with statin-induced necrotizing myopathy. The myositis associated antibodies are not that specific to the myositis, but they indicate underlying either connective tissue disorders or the malignancies. The ANA uh, is positive in uh, one third of the patients and uh, other antibodies, you can decide on the clinical uh, association. Like if you see features of scleroderma, you can ask for anti. PMSCL antibody. Uh, if you see patients with as well, features of um, interstitial lung disease, you can ask for anti CO and anti SSA. So these, these uh, antibodies are uh, not very specific to myositis itself. And muscle imaging uh, in modes of ultrasound and MRI, it's uh, used in other countries, but uh, in Sri Lanka, it's not very, very commonly used and you need a lot of uh, special uh, uh, knowledge on that. And uh, usually muscle imaging helps you to identify the inflammatory uh, the features of inflammation like muscle edema. And uh, you would see atrophied and um, uh, necrosed fibers as well. So the next pearl is uh, the immune mediated myopathies would be uh, indicating underlying malignancies. So the, the risk of malignancy is about two to seven times higher than in general population in patients with in, uh, inflammatory myopathies. The highest association is seen with patients with dermatomyositis and dermatomyositis is associated with lung, ovarian, and breast cancers. And polymyositis is associated with non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, lung, and bladder cancers. And usually the onset of malignancy is either uh, an year prior or at the year after the onset of immune-mediated myopathy. So always uh, look for underlying malignancies when you uh, get a di diagnosis of inflammatory myopathy. So when uh, considering the treatment, the treatment involves immune modulation as we do in all the other immune mediated um, diseases. We induce the remission and then we maintain the remission. Induction of remission um, uh, done according to the severity of the disease, clinical severity as well as the degree of CPK. And if the uh, patient is having the severe disease, you should go for IV methylprednisolone in a dose of 500 milligrams uh, in two to three doses every other day. And we monitor the uh, CPK levels. And uh, uh, after three doses, we convert the methylprednisolone into oral prednisolone. And we monitor the CPK. And once the CPK comes down, we can slowly uh, cut down the prednisolone uh, about five to 10 milligrams per month. And if, the, if there's only the moderate disease, you can start on oral prednisolone dose. Uh, 
And if the CPK is not improving after about one to two months, you should always go for the IV. The, the, you should step up the doses to IV, methylprednisolone or cyclophosphamide or immunoglobulin. Usually, the uh, inclusion body myositis patients, they do not respond to steroids, but we always give them a trial and see whether they show any sort of uh, um, improvement. And the dermatological manifestations of dermatomyositis would be treated with uh, sunlight avoidance, uh, the topical steroids and the tacrolimus and cyclosporin. The maintenance is uh, done with the steroid sparing agents, uh, methotrexate, estaprine, or mycophenolate. You can go for combination also. Every clinician practices uh, on their own experience and their expertise. And the second line drugs would be the uh, tacrolimus, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab is coming into play now. Uh, if the interstitial lung disease is present, always look for the um, uh, the, the go for cyclophosphamide uh, and o, or tacrolimus. So that is all for the acquired inflammatory myopathies and acquired non-inflammatory myopathies has this long list, but I'll be selecting few uh, common cases, common entities of uh, non-inflammatory myopathies and we'll be dealing uh, on them a little detail. So post-infectious toxic myopathies and myopathies associated with systemic diseases are the clinical entities. So when we look at drug-induced myopathies, two drug-induced myopathies are quite common, uh, the statin and the steroid-induced myopathies. Uh, Statin-induced myopathy is not a rare entity. We see that in uh, about 10% of the patients who are on statins, you know, most of the patients uh, who are older than 50 years or maybe the younger age even, most of them are now on statins. So about 10% of them are having features of myopathy. So the myopathy in statin-induced myopathy uh, uh, goes on a spectrum from myalgia to myositis and they might end up in uh, necrotizing autoimmune myopathy giving rise to rhabdomyolysis as well. Uh, you cannot see much histological abnormalities because the damage occurs at the mitochondria and there are risk factors of the patient like uh, older age, patients who are on so many drugs, uh, patients who are having renal impairment and patients who are having high doses of um, uh, steroids and uh, patients who are having sedentary lifestyle, they are having high chance of developing the statin-induced myopathy. Also, there are drug factors as well. The, if the drug is uh, on high dose or if the drug is more lipophilic or the, if, if the drug is less protein binding and if the drug is more bioavailable, those drugs tend to cause more myopathy than the other varieties. Uh, you know, the drug serivastatin was uh, taken out from the market because of fatal cases of fatal rhabdomyolysis occurred and even simvastatin has gone out of favor now. So when we manage a patient with statin-induced myopathy, we should, if we can, we can um, uh, stop the statin altogether or we should go for a lower dose of the same statin and monitor the uh, clinical uh, entity, clinical um, uh, uh, picture or else we can go for another uh, statin uh, in a spaced out manner. Either we can use every other day dosing or twice a week dosing. Rosuastatin and fluastatin, fluastatin are um, said to be a fairly uh, favorable statins in, with regard to myopathy. Uh, when we move on to the steroid-induced myopathy, there are two clinical entities of steroid-induced myopathy, uh, acute and chronic variety. Steroid-induced myopathy can occur in either exogenous or endogenous uh, use of steroids. And usually it's more common in fluor fluorinated steroids like uh, in dexamethasone, uh, rare in prednisolone and hydrocortisone. But in high doses, any of these can give rise to steroid-induced myopathy. Uh, the acute entity would present in a patient uh, within weeks uh, with generalized muscle weakness. Uh, it's not 
uh, involved in the proximal muscle, they come with generalized muscle weakness and they would come with very high CPK and myoglobinuria with focal or diffuse necrosis of muscle fibers as well. And the chronic variety presents with proximal muscle weakness and usually they get selective tibiaris anterior weakness, the foot and axial muscle involvement is very common in a chronic steroid induced myopathy. And here the CPK would be normal because the, the glucocorticoids down regulate the protein synthesis. So we can't go by the CPK level in this uh, entity of um, uh, chronic steroid induced myopathy. The biopsy would show selective type 2 fiber atrophy with no inflammation and we would see minimal wasting and again the women would be affected more than men and the patients who are having sedentary lifestyle would be having more uh, evidence of myopathy and they are more prone to get uh, chronic myopathy. Treatment is to reduce the doses and uh, for the uh, physiotherapy, especially the aerobic exercises. Uh, the next pearl is on alcohol-induced myopathy. Uh, alcohol-induced myopathy is about five times more common than, commoner than the cirrhosis because um, so, uh, you know all the, the clinicians and the patients are more aware of cirrhosis than the myopathy. Uh, the myopathy uh, is uh, occurring in 40 to 60 percent of the patients with chronic alcoholics and again there are three clinical entities in alcohol induced myopathy. One is the acute which is seen in binge drinkers usually about um, no, 0.5 to 2 percent of the patients present with this at the pr proximal muscle weakness with severe muscle pain and tenderness and you would see some muscle swelling and they would come with rhabdomyolysis as well with very high CPK and if you abstain from alcohol the symptoms would resolve within one to two weeks. The chronic entity is a fairly um, non uh, comes with fairly non-specific symptoms like uh, cramping, uh, stiffness, twitters, uh, and some of them would get atrophied and they are very sensitive to heat. And um, usually uh, it's uh, quite common in patients uh, who are using alcohol and it's, uh, the, it's said to be 200 in 100,000 general population. So this is about 10 times more common than the congenital myopathies. And usually this is associated with a cardiac dilated sort of cardiomyopathy as well. And the CPK here would be normal. And the patients who are having chronic variety would develop an acute on chronic disease if they binge on alcohol. And the treatment of course is abstinence from alcohol and they uh, say there is a nutritional component for the myopathy as well like the protein calorie malnutrition and vitamin D deficiency. So nutritional support would help for um, relieving the symptoms. The next entity is the hypothyroid myopathy which is an endocrine sort of a non-inflammatory myopathy quite common. The hypothyroidism is quite common in our country than hyperthyroidism and not like the hyperthyroid myopathy. The hypothyroid myopathy is seen about 80% of the patients with uncontrolled and untreated hypothyroidism. Again, the women of all age are affected more than men and this is seen in both the congenital and acquired forms of hypothyroidism. The clinical uh, features are very vague. Sometimes they come with just myalgia, muscle cramps, fatigue, and muscle weakness. And usually, a uh, cl few clinical uh, specifications are there in hypothyroid myopathies, like the patients would get hypertrophy of the muscles due to accumulation of this uh, glucose aminoglycans. And there's, uh, the, the, the fiber size would get enlarged as well in patients with hypothyroidism. And uh, the tendon reflexes would be delayed. And the CPK here is usually very high. It's not due to muscle damage as such, but due to leaking of CPK from the muscle tissue. And there are four clinical subtypes here. 
the the adult onset variety the childhood onset variety uh, there are some myasthenic variety and uh, the the hoffman's variety the, the, the we tend to lose the, we tend to uh, uh, miss this condition because uh, we are usually uh, not aware about the myopathic pattern of hypothyroidism and myoedema is one of the cardinal clinical features seen in hypothyroid myopathy when you tap on a muscle uh, at the ridge of the, the edge of the tap you get a muscle contraction there which is going on for about one to two minutes and then the muscle would get relaxed spontaneously that is due to the accumulation of um, sodium and calcium they are due to delayed uh, that, uh, release of the proteins and the treatment is of course thyroxine replacement and they the ck levels usually falls very quickly once you start on thyroxine and the uh, the falling of cpk can be seen uh, within few weeks before even the tsh comes down the symptoms would last for 6 to 12 months the last pearl is the critical illness myopathy again a quite common entity in ICU care where we see the patients uh, are difficult to wean from the ventilator support and the, the time onset here is quite uncertain because always the patients are um, on the, the ventilator and exposure to the neuromuscular blocking agents and the steroids increases the risk of uh, developing critical illness myopathy. The critical illness myopathy is associated with usually critical, critical illness polyneuropathy and critical illness polyneuromyopathy and uh, the diagnosis is usually the clinical suspicion or EMG and the risk factors are again the female sex and depending on the underlying disease entity, the, the, uh, the sepsis with multi-organ failure uh, patients would get about 100% the, the clinical illness myopathy and the duration of mechanical ventilation of course uh, uh, depends on uh, gives rise to the uh, is a risk factor and the treatment is modulating the inflammatory triggers either by the IVIG or plasma exchange and the physiotherapy so in summary these are the pearls of um, acquired myopathies